If understanding was as easy as seeing, archaeologists and scientists would have much easier careers. Archaeologists know their field very well, so the majority of times when they discover something new, they don't need any assistance to identify it and explain what it is. On those rare occasions that they don't understand what they're looking at, they turn to scientists for help. Sometimes even the scientists aren't sure, though. And that leaves us with mysteries like the ones you're about to see in this video. We already know that human sacrifice was common in and around Mexico in ancient times. But until recently, we had very little physical evidence of the practice. Our knowledge relied on texts and drawings. Now, thanks to new excavation work at the Popoloca ruins in Puebla, we may have been able to shed new light on the matter. Two stone carvings discovered there in January 2019 clearly illustrate skinned human skulls. And they're accompanied by a terrifying statue of Zipetotec. That's significant because Zipetotec is the deity known to the ancients as the Flayed Lord. And the statue is wearing so much skin that there's a human hand hanging from him. It's grisly. This gives credence to the idea that the Flayed Lord's followers wore human skin to perform their own rituals and ceremonies, which were usually centered around fertility and prosperity. The temple that the artifacts were found inside is about 1,000 years old and was still in use until the 12th century. Puzzlingly, although there's evidence that skin was stored here in special boxes, it doesn't appear that the actual sacrifices happened here. There's a lack of bones. We wonder where they went. What's underneath your house? Do you have a basement or a cellar? If so, what's underneath that? If you're not sure, perhaps you should have a look. You might find something like this gigantic 18th century ice house that turned up beneath a street in London, England in December 2018. Back in the 18th century, it was hard to keep ice to serve to guests in drinks. And so people relied on facilities like this, where whole solid blocks of ice imported from frozen Norwegian lakes were stored permanently. Despite being in Park Crescent West, a hugely desirable part of London, the existence of the ice house had somehow been completely forgotten by historians and town planners. How do you lose a 30-foot deep, 25-foot wide facility like this? Why are there so few records of it in the documents of the time? Without documentation, experts can only guess at the full extent of its use. But with the Harley Street dental surgery so close to the location, it's thought that the ice that was used to numb the mouths of patients during dental surgery may have come from here. If you're still laboring under the misapprehension that the Tyrannosaurus Rex was the largest dinosaur of all time, your information is badly out of date. The T-Rex lost that status a long time ago to far larger dinosaurs, but none so massive as the one that made this footprint in Australia. Found in a region that's now been dubbed Australia's Jurassic Park, this is the biggest dino footprint ever discovered. From heel to toe, it measures five and a half feet. From the footprint alone, paleontologist Steve Salisbury of the University of Queensland has estimated the dinosaur that made it must have been at least 18 feet tall at its hip, and he believes that it belongs to a previously unknown type of giant herbivore. The geological layer that it's imprinted in is about 90 million years old, so the giant lizard would have belonged to the Cretaceous era. There are footprints belonging to more than 20 different species of dinosaur embedded in the ground in this part of Australia, so it's no wonder it holds that nickname. Why have we never found evidence of this exceptionally massive dinosaur before, though? Depending on who or what you believe, the Emerald Tablet is either an ancient document that's been suppressed by the world's authorities because it contains evidence of powerful technology existing thousands of years ago, or it's an incredibly elaborate forgery. We can't tell you which one of those interpretations is correct, so we'll just tell you what we know. The legend of the Emerald Tablet is tied up with the legend of the Hermetica. Legends say that if all the texts that make up the Hermetica are put together in the correct order, the secret of creating gold from any other base metal will be revealed. If you think that sounds like the legend of the Philosopher's Stone, you're absolutely right. Most of the texts that comprise the Hermetica 
are composed in ancient Greek, or ancient Indian languages, and were written around 1800 years ago. The Emerald Tablet is different. It's more like 1200 years old, and it seems to have been translated from Arabic before any other language. So far, it hasn't helped anyone to fabricate gold from lesser metals, but perhaps we just don't have all the parts yet. If it is a forgery, the perpetrator is probably still laughing at us from their 1,200-year-old grave. You could argue that the Voynich Manuscript belongs in the same category as the Emerald Tablet, because for everyone who believes in its authenticity, there's someone else who thinks it's a forgery. The USA's Yale University takes it seriously enough to keep it locked up inside its Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, though, so perhaps there's something to be said for it being legitimate. The book is a total mystery. Allegedly, it was discovered in Rome in 1912, but radiocarbon dating of its pages has shown that it was written during the early 15th century. What makes the manuscript so unusual is that despite being 240 pages long, and filled with both writing and pictures, it cannot be read. The language, if it even is a language, is utterly impossible to translate. A cipher is provided, which suggests that the book is written in code, but the cipher doesn't appear to work. The theme of the illustrations changes so often that we can't even guess what the book might be about. Sometimes there are images of the anatomy of a flower, and on other pages, there are images of hairstyles of the era. Perhaps it's supposed to be the ultimate 15th century high society guide, but we don't know because we can't make sense of it. Like the legend of Robin Hood in England, the tale of Yasuke is a popular story told to children in Japan, but there's a big difference. Robin Hood is a work of fiction. Yasuke, the first ever African samurai, was very real. We know precious little about him, but what we do know of him is remarkable. He arrived in Kyoto in 1579, and his appearance stunned the locals. Not only was he black, a skin tone the Japanese of the time rarely saw, but he was over six feet tall. The average height of a male in 16th century Japan was a little under five feet. To them, he'd have seemed like a giant. Just one year later, he was fluent in Japanese and was made a fully-fledged samurai by the feudal lord Oda Nobunaga. Normally, Japanese men had to train their whole lives to become a samurai. This mysterious African man had done it in a single year and is thought to be the first foreigner ever to be accepted into the ranks of the legendary warriors. Just three years after that, he vanishes from history completely. Nobody knows who or where he was before he entered Japan, and nobody knows what happened to him afterward. We don't even know his real name. Yasuke is a Japanese affectation. Many different types of burial traditions exist all over the world, but one of the strangest can be found in the American South in the shape of the mysterious comb graves. Also known as tent graves, these burial spots have a headstone the same as any other graveyard. But the bodies they protest are protected below two slabs of concrete, forming a pyramid shape. There are more than 3,000 of them in Tennessee alone, with dates ranging from 1820 to the early 1900s. From a historical perspective, that's quite recent, and so you'd think we'd know why the graves were made this way. And yet we don't. One theory is that gravediggers in the area struggled to dig into the rocky terrain without the kind of equipment we use for the task in modern days. And so the graves are shallow and in need of additional protection. Another is that they're designed to stop livestock and people from walking over the graves unwittingly. A more spiritualist possibility is that the slabs were added to prevent the dead from rising out of their graves and returning to torment the living. The folklore tales of Hertfordshire in England say that Royston Cave was a secret hideout used by the Knights Templar. But as is the case with most things concerning the Knights Templar, that's more likely to be fiction than fact. There are certainly carvings and paintings in the cave that feature Templar symbols, but there are also pagan symbols alongside them. The Templar would have considered the presence of pagan symbols to be heresy, so it's doubtful that they spent much, if any, time here. The cave was excavated accidentally by workmen in 1742 and has been a puzzle ever since. 
The shape and design of the space are similar to Jerusalem's Church of Holy Sepulchre. But again, why would a place designed to be a Christian place of worship contain pagan symbols like the Shila Nagig? As no records of the cave's existence prior to its discovery existed, dating its construction and use is a difficult task. And so estimates vary from the 13th century to the 16th. The sad truth is that we'll probably never find out who created Royston Cave, nor what they intended it to be. Traveling up the British Isles from Hertfordshire, you'll eventually find Fingal's Cave in the Scottish Isle of Staffa. There's no mystery about who designed this stunning piece of rocky architecture. It was Mother Nature herself. The astonishingly symmetrical cave, full of flowing geometric shapes, was created by an ancient lava flow approximately 60 million years ago. It was the same lava flow that created the Giant's Causeway, so it's possible that a physical connection once existed between the two locations. Some of the locals prefer not to believe that, though. They'd rather stick to the story that it was created by a giant named Finn McCool, who lived in it as he prepared to do battle with his great rival, the Scottish giant Benendonner. Humans have been enchanted by Fingal's cave and its mystical qualities for centuries. The Celts called it the Cave of Melody. The great German composer Felix Mendelssohn was inspired to write the Hebrides Overture after visiting it during the 19th century, and the painter J. M. W. Turner once represented it in his own work. Even in more recent times, British prog rock band Pink Floyd came up with a song called Fingal's Cave in the 1960s. Its great mystery, though, is the music that it produces alone. Sometimes, when the wind blows the right way and the tide is in the right place, this cave will sing to you. You've heard of Stonehenge, but have you heard of Woodhenge? We wouldn't be surprised if you haven't. Most English people don't know of its existence, even though it's only two miles away from its far more famous stone sibling in Wiltshire. Woodhenge has hidden in plain sight for centuries. Its existence was only noticed in 1925, after the invention of aerial photography. Many people had known that there were curious holes in this field before that point, but without seeing them from above, they couldn't tell that they were arranged in concentric circles, patterns that look a lot like the arrangement of Stonehenge. Welsh archaeologist Maud Cunnington took up the challenge of investigating the holes in the years that followed and determined that they were once filled by wooden posts. In total, there were six rings, all of which were themselves encircled by a ditch and a mound. More recently, each of the holes has been filled in with a concrete market to give an impression of the site as it would have appeared some 4,400 years ago. As it was built at the same time as Stonehenge, it might have been a practical site for the real thing. But why did those ancient builders practice six times with six different circles? If dragons have never existed, why did the ancient Greeks build houses for them? That might seem like a facetious question, but you'll find plenty of people in Greece who believe that these odd ruins, found on the south side of the Greek island of Euboea, truly were made to house the mythical beasts. The megalithic houses were made without the use of any mortar, with lintels and jams holding everything together. The sheer weight of the rocks pressed on top of each other like this ought to crush the doorway, but it doesn't. Scientists can't even work out how ancient builders managed to move the massive rocks into their current position in the first place. To compound the mystery, each dragon house is built at high altitude and contains a circular roof opening. Presumably, that's how the dragons got in and out. The doorway must have been for their human visitors. Unusually for ancient Greece, no record of the construction of the dragon houses exists. We have no idea who built them, how they built them, or why they built them. No wonder the locals suspect that magical creatures were involved. The whole purpose of a door is to act as a portal from one place to another. If the doorway leads to solid rock, there's very little point to it at all. So why is there one in the middle of a park in Rome, Italy? And why is it so revered? The answer is that people believe that this doorway, known as Porta Alchemica, is magical. 
The doorway, which is surrounded by baffling inscriptions and runes, was designed by Marquis Massimiliano Palombara during the early 17th century. Back then, it was an entrance to his villa, most of which has now been utterly destroyed. The Marquis had a strong interest in alchemy and the dark arts, but even he didn't understand the symbols etched around the doorway. They were given to him by a man who claimed he could use herbs to turn metal into gold, and that the symbols contained the answer. Unable to comprehend them himself, the Marquis had them etched onto his doorway in the hope that someone would pass by, see and understand the symbols, and then knock on his door to explain the secret to him. Most of the symbols have since been translated, save for the one directly above the doorway, which remains a mystery. Some people even say that people have walked through the door into the rock, never to return. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!